Hello, everybody. Uh, I think it's about time to get started. I guess we've got a few people coming in. I can, I can vamp for a minute while, uh, while people come in, do a little song and dance, come up with other ways to work the word potato into talks. Uh, my name is James Blair. I'm one of the uh, maintainers of Zool. I'm the current project lead, and I uh, helped start the project uh, 10 years ago. I think it's 10 years uh, as of last week. And yeah, I guess maybe we could close the doors. That would be great. There's a, there's a very high energy uh, summit going on outside. So as I was saying, uh, my name is James Blair. I'm one of the Zool maintainers, and I uh, started a company called Acme Gating, which is uh, the world's first project gating company. Um, <laughs> it, uh, it's focused on uh, supporting Zool, supporting people that want to use Zool in the enterprise. And uh, I'm here to give sort of an overview of what Zool is and what project gating is. Um, Zool was originally developed for the OpenStack project. Uh, the, the problem that we were presented with is that OpenStack is built out of a lot of different components. There are actually a lot of projects. They all have to work together, but they're all built by different teams. Um, so you know these teams go off and, and, and do their own thing in their own project, and then all of these projects get combined together into a larger system. That might sound familiar to folks who work in the enterprise. And so it turns out that all of this work that we did to support Zool for OpenStack can be leveraged by others. And, and it actually ended up being a lot more generally applicable than we thought. We thought we were dealing with a unicorn at, at the time. We thought like nobody else builds software like this. But it turns out everybody does. Everybody has these problems. And so Zool is now being used by countless other projects and, uh, and, and companies. Um, as I said, I, uh, I helped start and maintain the Zool project. And uh, I, I'm now spend all of my time helping companies use Zool more effectively. Uh, so why is Zool interesting? Um, a, a lot of things that we thought were really important when we were developing OpenStack uh, have kind of made their way into Zool and really uh, uh, define its character. Um, one of the first things is that it's Git driven. So in OpenStack, we had uh, we intentionally developed a very strong code review culture, and uh, the idea is that anybody should be able to propose changes to any of the OpenStack projects, and then the maintainers of those projects would review the changes and approve them and get them merged. Uh, one of the the key aspects of this is that. Uh, we tried to get humans out of, uh, out of the loop as much as possible and automate as many things as possible. And so a result of that is that a lot of our processes in OpenStack and then later on in Zool and, and in the open infra community in general are, are Git driven. Because the more, that, the more that we can put into Git uh, and uh, the more that we can put into Git, the more things are available for anybody to go in and, and contribute directly. So Zool does not have a kind of web interface where an administrator goes and click, 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 and defines jobs and, and things like that. It's uh, it, to the greatest degree possible. Everything is defined in Git repositories, uh, which uh, can be contributed to and uh, reviewed by people. By putting all of this information in Git repositories, we, we've now given ourselves actually a mechanism to alter how, uh, how control of a CI or CD system is, is performed. So again, going back to the idea of uh, an administrator using a web interface to define jobs, only that person uh, has, has that, uh, that ability and how they define um, how that ability is scoped is sort of defined by what's implemented in the web interface, whereas by putting things in Git, we have this ability to uh, have 
both centralized and decentralized control of the system at the same time. And, and really, it's kind of a sliding scale uh, as, uh, as we do that. So um, uh, developers can, can put things in uh, uh, a, a central repository or uh, in a, uh, a sort of edge repository, uh, a repo that's being used for uh, development of software itself. Uh, Zool's configuration constructs can be put in any of these things, and the combination uh, of you know, you know how you tell Zool like read your configuration from this repo in this case, read it from this and in another case, sort of lets you find the sweet spot for uh, for having both centralized or decentralized control. Um, Zool supports cross-project collaboration. Uh, again, going back to the idea of of, of Git repos. Um, uh, I'm actually going to go into detail, uh, more detail about this a little bit later. Uh, it has this idea of speculative execution, so that um, uh, Zool's, uh, rather than testing things as written, Zool is going to test things as they will be when they're merged in a, a potential future state. And finally, all of this is leading up to the idea of project gating. Um, so uh, I'm going to go into these uh, uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit more detail. Um, I feel like I've, I've I've actually talked about Git quite a bit, but uh, the the key aspect here is that code and infrastructure changes can be uh, committed together. So when when you're working on a, a software project and you want to uh, uh, change how the software functions, you can change how it's tested and how it's deployed all in the same commits, all in the same series of commits, and Zool can handle that holistically. So uh, it's really bringing the, the ideas of continuous integration and continuous, continuous deployment into the realm of development uh, and, and doing all of those things together. Um, like I said, there's a, 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 you, you have the choice of central or, or uh, distributed localized control. A lot of that in Zool comes from the idea of Zool's tenants. Zool is a, a multi-tenant application, so you can, uh, uh, as an enterprise, say, you could define a tenant for uh, one part of your organization, another tenant for a different part of your organization, and those groups can, uh, can operate the system uh, effectively um, uh, com completely separate from each other. So um, this lets you uh, save, uh, it's, it lets you run a much more efficient system. You can run a single Zool for your entire enterprise and have as many tenants as you need to, to give local groups control there. And uh, like I said, because things are in Git repos, you can share those repos between tenants whenever you do want them to collaborate. Um, Zool has uh, the idea of cross-repo dependencies. And this is something that uh, really hasn't shown up in any system other in, than Zool in any significant way at this point. Zool supports a number of different uh, Git backends. It supports, uh, Garrett was the first one, um, and then we added support for GitHub and GitLab and Pagur. And what Zool does is it actually doesn't care where the code comes from or where the changes come from. It treats all of these systems completely equally, and uh, you, can, you can write a change to a repository in Garrett, and you can tell Zool that that change depends on a change to a different repository in Garrett, and Zool will make sure those changes are tested together. That doesn't stop at the Garrett boundary, though. If you have some developers using Garrett and some developers using GitHub or some developers using GitLab, uh, you can hook your, the same Zool system up to all of those and uh, actually have a change to a Garrett repository that depends on a change in a GitLab repository. By expressing dependencies between these two, you can actually bridge systems which otherwise wouldn't be able to talk to each other in any uh, reasonable manner. So you can you, you can have jobs that 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 check out unmerged changes from projects in multiple code review systems, and they all get uh, uh, checked out into the same uh, workspace in the same job and run and test it together. So 
the next key thing to know about Zool is its idea of uh, speculative execution. And the way that I like to think about this is kind of the evolution of CI systems. So when the first CI systems came out, CI standing for continuous integration, the idea was that after you merged a change to your Java project, you would then integrate the project and see if it still worked. And you would do that after every change or, or, or maybe even just on a fixed schedule. And, uh, and you would be notified of the breakage as soon as possible after it happened. So basically, what these systems were doing is testing the past. At some point, people realized, well, you can, you can actually run these tests uh, on changes before they're merged. And so we ended up with this idea of pre-merge checking. So somebody opens up a pull request on GitHub, pushes a change up to Garrett, uh, a, a CI system uh, checks that out and runs tests on it and says this either does or does not work as written. That's testing the present. Uh, Zool goes a step beyond that, and we call this project gating. And the idea is that at every point, you're trying to test the future. So it's not just the change as it was written by the, de sorry, by the developer. It's the change as it will eventually be merged into the Git repository. And there's a couple of nuances about that. One, it means that if between the time of the developer writing the change and its eventual merge, if the repository itself has moved on, because it turns out there's other developers working on the same thing at the same time, and they get their changes merged. Uh, if the repository has moved on, you need to run the tests again, and Zool is going to do that. So essentially what Zool does is uh, it prepares uh, right when a change is, is ready to merge, it prepares the repository as it is at that moment, and then merges the change that it that it's, it speculatively merges the change that's under test into that. And if there are any dependencies, it's going to merge those changes in as well. Um, and, uh, and so what we're doing is we're testing the proposed future state. And if the tests pass, then we sort of atomically make that future state reality. So the guarantee here is not that the change worked when the developer wrote it. The guarantee is that when this change merged, it worked. And being able to do that, plus being able to combine it with other potentially unmerged changes is extremely powerful. And it actually changes the way developers work. So um, to sort of take this idea from another tack, um, the, I, I would define the word gating as saying that every change pro proposed to a repository is tested before it merges. That's, that's the simplest way of looking at this. Uh, you know, it's, it's literally a gate. You know, it either passes the, these tests and gets merged, or it doesn't. You can extend that idea with co-gating, um, where you, if there are changes to a set of repositories, again, think about the OpenStack use case, where all of this came from. Uh, OpenStack has Nova and Swift and Keystone and all these other projects. Uh, in this case, you're looking at changes to a set of repositories merged monotonically such that each change is tested with the current state of all the other related repositories before it merges. So the, 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 advance, the advancement here is the idea that we're not just gating changes to a single repository, we're gating changes to all of these repositories together at the same time. And then finally, um, Zool uh, goes overboard here and implements this idea of parallel co-gating so that uh, to do this more efficiently, we actually put all of these changes into a virtual serialized queue uh, and uh, test every, every stage of that queue with all of the changes ahead of it uh, under the assumption that they're all going to pass. And uh, by doing that, we're able to merge things a little more quickly. So you can imagine that um, the, a, a naive implementation of project gating might just uh, 
test a change and then merge it and then test another change and, and merge it. And if it takes you an hour to merge a change, you can't merge more than 24 changes to all of your projects in a day. And nobody, nobody I know wants to work that slowly. So by having Zool start all of these jobs in parallel, um, uh, it's able to increase the throughput. Uh, of the whole system. So here's sort of a, a graphic view of that. Um, when, when Zool is setting up its virtual serialized queue, um, you might have a couple of changes that are already merged uh, in the repository. So you know, start with that. And then Zool is, uh, uh, somebody approves the change, and Zool starts testing that change. Somebody approves a, uh, two more changes after that. And you've, now you've got this queue of three changes that are all lined up to be merged. Zool starts the test for all of those in parallel. And if any one of them, for instance, this uh, second one from the bottom, starts failing its tests, then Zool will pull that out of the queue, finish running the test so that we give the, the, the results back to the developers as quickly as possible. But by pulling it out of the queue and uh, resequencing the changes behind it, Zool is able to improve the throughput of the whole process and still potentially merge these changes, if not at the same time, uh, nearly at the same time. So the overall throughput of the system can be quite high, even though we're being extremely rigorous about uh, making sure that every change is tested. So uh, as an example of how you can use this idea of speculative execution across different repositories, um, you could imagine a change to your infrastructure, right? Uh, the, the back end of, uh, of a software system. And you have to implement that first. Then once, that, uh, once that's implemented, somebody, a, a front end developer, writes some uh, functionality to use what is newly available in the back end. Um, uh, sorry, I've actually got this backwards. Let me start over. You might need to write something in a library, uh, which then is used by something in the front end, uh, which then uh, infrastructure deploys. So uh, by having, uh, being able to create this dependency graph, uh, you can actually have Zool test all of these changes together before any of them have been merged. Um, this is uh, actually something that Clark talked about a little bit in his, his talk earlier. Um, it's extremely powerful because uh, you can, s in a complex system where, where um, changes are, are touching multiple components, you can actually see that all of them uh, completely function as designed before you merge any of them into any repositories. So by doing this, you're, you're doing the testing up front. You're avoiding having to revert out changes because you thought you fixed a, a bug or you implemented something correctly and, and it didn't actually work right. Um, uh, you're essentially front-loading all of the testing. So uh, this is going back to my, my previous uh, illustration. Of, uh, of speculative execution. If you apply, apply this to multiple uh, repositories, then again, you know, say you've got some library changes, those merge, uh, those have to merge first, then a front end change, and then your infra cha infrastructure changes can be all lined up behind that. So uh, in this way, Zool is enforcing the sequence of events as well. Uh, that front end change isn't going to merge until the library changes merge ahead of it. Likewise, the infrastructure change isn't going to work, merge at all in this case because it's failing. Uh, but uh, you get the idea that, that Zool is helping you test all of these things together and make sure that they are merged in the correct sequence. Zool is, um, again, because of its birth in the OpenStack ecosystem, it's, uh, uh, it definitely has a bias towards clouds. Uh, it, um, the, generally, when you're using Zool, you're going to want to hook it up to a cloud provider to give it ephemeral test nodes. So uh, you, you can hook it up to OpenStack, AWS, Google, Azure, or the IBM Cloud. Um, these are all uh, basically interchangeable node providers that Zool can use when it's uh, starting tests. So the idea is that it uh, gets a virtual machine from one of these cloud providers, spins it up, starts running the test on it, and destroys the VM at the end. So this is a way of making sure that all of the builds are reproducible, 
Um, they, they all start from a clean slate. So uh, as, as a developer collaborating with other developers, you know that um, uh, anybody starting on a project, um, they're going to get the same results uh, from starting from a clean slate. Zool also works with Kubernetes and, and OpenShift. So you can run jobs on pods. Uh, or get Kubernetes namespaces to dis uh, deploy systems in there. And finally, um, uh, static nodes are also supported. So if you have some real hardware that you're testing against, um, either bare metal or some kind of um, specialized hardware rig uh, that you've got hooked up to a bare metal machine, uh, you, can, uh, you can enroll these static nodes and node pool uh, can manage them, and Zool will use them in the same way that it uses cloud resources. Uh, one of the key things to know about this is that all of these things are interchangeable. So uh, in a way, the failure domain for Zool isn't just um, at, uh, at the cloud level. It's sort of at a multi-cloud level. So you can have redundant clouds providing resources to Zool, and um, if an entire public cloud has an outage, which does happen from time to time, that's fine. Zool will just use resources from a different cloud instead. Zool has native support for multi-node jobs. So if your job run needs more than just a single node to run on, uh, for instance, if you have a system where you need to set up a, uh, uh, a controller node and then you have multiple compute nodes or something like that that you're testing out, you can uh, tell Zool to request multiple nodes at the same time, and, uh, and uh, your job can use all of those resources together. So it's a very expressive way of uh, creating jobs, which is um, quite uh, difficult to achieve in other systems, but it's very natural in Zool. And part of the way it, it's so natural is that Zool's job language is actually Ansible. So when you get to the point of writing what a job is going to do, it's, um, you know, we thought about it and we're like, should we create yet another job definition, uh, or sorry, uh, job control language? Um, but we realized there's already one out there. There's already one out there that lets you say, run this thing on node A and run this other thing on node B, and that's called Ansible. So when you write Zool jobs, you can write Ansible playbooks um, where you could, as an example here, uh, have roles that run just on the controller, have roles that just run on compute nodes, and that's the way that, that you can uh, request these multiple different types of nodes from Zool and then orchestrate what happens on them in the job. Zool is also highly scalable. So it itself is uh, it, it's a sort of microservices-based application. And uh, this is a list of all the components uh, of Zool. Um, and at this point, as of early this year in Zool version 5, every single one of these components is both scalable and, uh, and redundant. So you can run multiple versions, uh, sorry, multiple copies of every single one of these components. And uh, by doing that, your Zool system can be fault tolerant. Uh, it can have zero downtime upgrades because you can do a rolling restart of the entire system. Uh, and it can be scalable in that as you run more and more jobs, add more tenants, add more projects, you can scale up these components to meet your needs. So that's a quick overview of what uh, what Zool is and some of our the, the key concepts behind it. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Zool, uh, go to zoolci.org. Um, and uh, there's information, uh, there's a tutorial there to uh, get your own Zool up and running. Uh, there's plenty of documentation and, and other resources there. There's information about how to get involved in the community. We have uh, online chat via uh, the Matrix system. Uh, mailing lists, that sort of thing. And if you'd like to find out more about the services I offer, you can go to acmegating.com. And we do have some time for questions. So if anybody has a question, there's actually a microphone over there, um, and we can, uh, we can all hear your question. 
Um, can you speak to the relationship between explicit dependencies that are potentially cross-project that you um, express with depends on and their relationship to the implicit dependencies that we get out of the DAG that we have in a Git repo and how that works across multiple repos. Yes. Um, and did everybody here in the room hear that? Great. Um, so uh, I, I sort of used the word dependencies and, and glossed over the fact that there are actually a lot of different kinds of dependencies. And, uh, and it is worth being aware of all of them and how to use them in Zool. Uh, and then it's also worth being aware that once Zool recognizes a dependency, it behaves exactly the same way uh, no matter where it came from. So this is sort of, you know, when I, earlier when I was talking about how you can uh, uh, incorporate changes from different code review systems, the reason that works is because by the time they show up in Zool, Zool doesn't care where they came from anymore or what kind of dependency there are. So yes, there are uh, a couple of different kinds. Um, there's there's the, uh, uh, the dependencies that come from Git itself. So um, if you have multiple Git commits, um, a sequence of Git commits sort of implicitly depends, you know, the one on the end depends on the one uh, ahead of it and so forth. In some code review systems, that's not a big deal because you're, you're kind of like in GitHub, you, you, you make a branch and you put a bunch of commits on that branch and you open a pull request for that branch and the pull request is what Zool sees. And so Zool is going to, um, it, it's going to enqueue that pull request into its pipeline. And that's the thing that is going to change. And that, that's implicitly going to have all of those commits bundled up into it as a unit. In Garrett, on the other hand, if you make a bunch of commits and then upload them, each one of those commits shows up as a distinct change in Garrett. And so Zool recognizes that and it treats each of those changes because in Garrett, you, you can individually merge each of those changes, right? Uh, obviously in GitHub, if you merge a pull request, you've merged all of the commits. In Garrett, uh, even if you have a bunch of commits, you, you can still merge them one at a time. So Zool implicitly treats those as dependencies between them. And so, uh, you know, if you have a series of commits ABC, Zool is going to enqueue ABC in that order and, in, uh, and both assume and enforce that, that dependency series. Um, going back, uh, I guess, stepping up a little, there's the idea of cross-project dependencies, which obviously can't be expressed as git commits, nor can they be expressed as pull requests in GitHub, uh, because you can't have a branch that has more than one project in it. So to do this in Zool, what we do is, is we add a depends on uh, footer to the commit message in Garrett or to the pull request um, message in GitHub. And you can say that this, uh, this change, pull request, whatever, depends on something else. And what you do is you say, depends on colon, and then you give the URL of the something else. So that could be the URL of a change in Garrett, the URL of another pull request in GitHub. Um, and again, and this is where you could start to do the, the cross project or cross source thing. It doesn't, it, it can be, it's, it's almost always gonna be a change in a different project, but that different project can be in the same code review system or a different code review system. Um, finally, we actually just added one more kind of dependency uh, uh, to Zool, which is the topic dependencies in Garrett. There's actually this behavior in Garrett that some Garrett's use and some Garrett's don't. We don't in OpenStack, which is why this wasn't a priority, uh, but other Garrett and Zool users do use this. Um, and that's the idea of, of uh, pushing up changes to different projects within a single Garrett and having them under the same topic. That's a way that you indi indicate to Garrett that all of these changes should be uh, merged simultaneously. So uh, what we do with that in Zool is we implicitly treat them as cross-project circular dependencies, um, which is, it, we're starting to get into like uh, mind-bending things here, but uh, that means that every change in the dependency cycle, so all, you know, um, uh, all of these changes that are under the same topic will be tested together and 
not merged in sequence, but merged simultaneously. So if you have a dependency in project, if project A depends on a change in B, and that same change in B depends on something in A, in other words, you want to simultaneously change two projects at the same time atomically, you can do that in Zool and still have them tested together. So that's the quick, <laughs> quick overview of the many types of dependencies that, that Zool handles. Uh, any other questions? All right, I think we're actually exactly at time anyway. So thank you all for coming and yeah.